Do you think that Eminem ever figured out which Spice Girl that he wants to impregnate? Because <laughs> <laughs> long run, I think that it, it seems like Ginger was the way to go to me. Hello and welcome to Hallelujah Monkeys for June 12th. My name is Dylan Flynn. My name is Trevor Ickrath and welcome to the season two finale of... Uh hallelujah monkeys although honestly i'm feeling like it might be the last episode we ever do oh really we're done yeah well because uh i wanted to talk to you about something you know i think if we had a previously on hallelujah monkeys segment uh preceding each episode we'd flash back to the last episode uh it would be me absolutely losing my shit at the prospect of an out of body video we talked about this last week we were trying to figure out what music video they could possibly be filming we looked at some clues offered by jamie himself and we came to the conclusion that they were filming out of body. We were pretty sure about it. We were pretty sure and pretty stoked. I feel like the the dot connecting that we were doing was maybe better than like conspiracy map dot connecting. I think we had some legitimate clues. We had a defendable we case there for thinking yeah. that it might be out of body. However, since that episode, we've received some additional clues that kind of are pointing us in a different direction dylan do you want to say what those are because i just can't even talk about this barely (laughs) yeah uh well they filmed at least some of uh, the new gorillas video this week and thanks to the instagram accounts of jamie hewlett's wife emma de cons and uh david albarn's uh daughter missy albarn we have pretty good indication that that is going to be strobe light strobe light is the next video based on there being giant monitor uh hanging over the dance floor that says strobe light on it. I think the best way to describe how I am feeling right now is betrayed. <laughs> I'm betrayed. I'm feeling I'm feeling betrayed by the band. I am feeling betrayed by by you, Dylan, honestly, for letting me get so <laughs> hyped about this. And honestly, I think this has just kind of put me off gorillas permanently. So right. yeah, see series finale. Uh, of Hallelujah Monkeys. Let's just, oh, let's no. get this one in that I'm out. Well, yeah. in that case, let's make the most of it. First of all, Trevor, I do want to say, if you're a listener to this podcast, I'm not saying that we're ever going to do another episode, uh, but but if we do, uh, and you are a listener, and you were at the Strobe Light video shoot, please get in contact with us. We are very interested to know what was going on there. We know that you signed an NDA. We are aware of that, but journalistic integrity... We will fight to the nail to protect your anonymity. We will give you final approval over anything we're allowed to say about your experience on the air. We will not let you get in trouble. So please email us, hallelujahmonkeys at gmail.com. We want to know the skinny. Um, Should we get into the news? Yeah, I mean, once more with feeling, right? (laughs) Once more with feeling. One last time. One last time. We don't really have a little cluster of news stories this time. We really just have one kind of big framing event, don't we? One massive fuck all crazy gorillas bacchanalian orgy of greatness. Uh, what better way to ring in gorillas season, though, right? Amazingly, with this this once in a lifetime, maybe not, maybe maybe this new annual tradition. Of the Demon Days Festival. The Demon Days Festival. In Margate. At Dreamland. It happened. I just kept having to remind myself, like, holy shit, there is a massive music festival surrounding my favorite band. Crazy, right? And of course, neither of us were able to be there, but we did watch the live stream on uh, Red Bull, right? I I thought it was Red Bull because every now and then the kind of picture would uh, cut out and it would just cut to this footage of like kind of a bunch of like stormtrooper-esque characters you stepping everywhere i wasn't really sure what was going on there that's a good point uh if you didn't watch the stream i would like to alert you that there are all kinds of very piratable bootleggable copies floating around don't give them any money that they don't need yeah gorillas have already made all the money they're going to off of this stream who knows uh, what kind of cause you're helping to advance by giving red bull money this is one of the only times I think we will advocate for piracy, but yeah, this is a this is a good case of when you'd probably be better off getting it through less above board. Yeah, probably means. so. Trevor, let's just let's talk about this amazing festival, huh? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, what do you want to start with? How should we get this conversation going? Well, I want to just briefly say because I don't even know if you got a chance to see this. You were kind of I getting... was able to catch. I'll tell you right now. I started when I uh I only started once they started airing reruns, but I saw um like 
five minutes of a little Sims set, and I turned that off because she took four times to start a song. And I realized that Danny Brown was going on at the same time. And like, of course, I'm going to watch Danny Brown. I watched Sims over Danny Brown, so I'm I'm glad that you got to see that one. Uh, Sims eventually did have a, an amazing set after things kind of got moving. Oh, I can imagine. Um, but I wanted to take a minute to just point out that the defining supporting performance of the night for me was the set by Kylo Kish, known for her very interesting, unique performance on Out of Body, and I don't even know how to explain what I saw her do in her own set, Trevor. I think you told me that she came across as like a cross between like a hip-hop Kate Bush and like very Bjorkish, which, I mean, checks out for me. <laughs> so, so she comes out wearing what I think, it looked like it was this sort of black linen suit. Her, her facial expressions are real bizarre. She's doing one of these performances where you're like, either this is really artistic or we should call somebody. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> is she going insane? And then the props started making appearances. She had like a red corded telephone that was wired to something inside of her outfit. So she like pulled it out and it was unclear what it was attached to. And then at one point she started carrying this briefcase under her crook of her arm. <laughs> Like, not holding it like you would hold a briefcase, but we're just like, what is she doing? And then for her grand finale, Trevor, she took that briefcase, which was apparently full of, like, ticker tape and papers, and fucking got down on her knees and Pete Townsend it like a fucking guitar. Just bashed it until it was pieces on the stage. It was amazing. Rock and roll. <laughs> it was very rock and roll. Let's get into the fucking main event. The yeah, Gorillas let's... set. Yeah. Giant Gorillas Festival headline Two set. Two hours and ten minute headline set. Can we just say, before we even get started, I think this is the defining filmed live Gorillas performance. I've seen I a lot of fans that, saying that. I mean, it's definitely better than what, like Coachella? Coachella. There's also, of course, uh, uh, Glastonbury and Demon yeah. Days Live. It's well, got Demon some, Days Live will always have a special place in my heart. There are some things that Demon Days Live does better than this, but I think just in terms of the... Of, well, we'll get into it. There's a run in this set that is, like, unreal. I think if you see Gorillas and you're a fan, this is the kind of set and the performance that you want. Okay, let's let's start with the intro, Okay, Trevor. Very interesting. Kind of played into the Illuminati imagery that has been surrounding the visual art that's been used to promote this festival. That came up a couple times in the set, I'm pretty sure. It did. And throughout the day, Trevor, the black robed hooded figures who uh who make the the grand entrance had been wandering around Dreamland and handing out these little cards to people with like cryptic messages on them and things. The cool clown clan. <laughs> what are they though? What kind of role are they playing here? I don't know. They seem evil, don't they? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I mean, come on. Can you imagine a gorilla's phase where we actually like have a clear antagonist and we know exactly what role they're playing i think it would i don't think it would be good i prefer it this way yeah where we're where we're left to kind of try to piece things together and have our theories gorilla's lore there's uh there's some music that they walked in on trevor (laughs) some some instrumental music i missed this i actually didn't start um the set until the end of last living souls so you're gonna have to catch me up on the very okay i'll catch you up i'll catch you up so so the, the hooded figures with their blue Demon Days Festival flags, they started to file up towards the stage, walking through the crowd, around the crowd, looking like color guards. The, the KKK reference was not lost on anybody. Mm-hmm. And this music was playing, Trevor. And yesterday, an enterprising fan attempted to upload this introduction to YouTube. And they got a copyright strike for it. Lame. And the copyright strike said, check this out, Copyright violation, gorillas, Phoenix on the Hill. What does that mean? That means that the fucking song, the the B-side of Hallelujah Money on the Super Deluxe Vinyl was used as the entrance music for gorillas. Fascinating. I know. And so anyway, so they get on stage, there's like 20 of them, right? And then a few, they dissipate and a few stay behind and unzip their their garments to reveal that they are Damon Albarn Lord. and the core humans live band. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry I missed Very that. Cool. I'm really sorry I missed that. What a, what a fucking ham Damon has turned into, huh? <laughs> the ultimate. I love him. You see a lot in this performance, too. Oh, this, this is a fucking ham sandwich if ever there was one. Like, that opening and then something he does right at the end are so perfect Damon ham. Yep. Okay, 
So then we kick things off with, uh, after a little bit of Ben Mendelsohn switching his robot off, we kick things off with Ascension. So, so Vince comes out, fucking charge up, energized, looking, looking real slick. Two of our, our Discord members on the Hallelujah Monkeys Discord uh, were there at Demon Days, and both of them made a point to tell us that uh, the crowd was, like, riot-level intense during Ascension. Sick. I mean, as it should be. Everybody was, like, jumping and going fucking nuts during Ascension. It's a and, great uh, set opener. I mean, for sure. It sure is a great... It, it, it's really... Especially live and especially with Vince there, it was just... It was really cool. Gets the people going. Next, they played Last Living Souls, and one of my favorite uh, things that jumped out to me here is that this song still does not have any permanent lyrics. Damon talks about walking down to the beach, and he ends it with, like, am I the last or am I me? Really fun stuff. Uh, and then we moved straight into Saturn's Bars with PopCon there... This is very cool, very effective. Damon did that, does that thing that he likes to do now when his collaborators are on stage where he like starts to sidle up towards them like, hey, do you want to kind of dance with me? Are we going to do this? And, and PopCon recall, responded to the call with like, fuck yeah, I'll dance with you, Damon Alvarn. It was very fun. Uh, Damon has some great chemistry with a lot of the guests on this album, I think. Oh, absolutely. For sure. After that, we did Stylo, and this is interesting. Yeah, because um, Booty Brown filled in for most deaf, huh? Booty Brown did most deaf's part, which, which I think think he kind of nailed he did a great job and honestly i wish this is something the band would experiment with more often we saw it a couple times in this set but yeah i mean especially on stylo because even everett was also doing bobby womack's part he also nailed it he also did a terrific job and they did a really cool thing there was like a disc a second screen that was in the shape of a disc at the top of the stage Mm -hmm. that they would occasionally throw some art onto in addition to the big giant jumbotron behind them right and they put a they put a big picture of of bobby womack sort of smiling down on everyone that's great because like damon did say like as they launched into this one this one's for bobby womack so next they played tomorrow comes day which i'm just gonna admit Sounds kind of flat without that drum break. You and I actually mentioned um, in our gorilla, um, our self-titled episode that when uh, they brought Dan in, he kind of threw out a lot of live percussion tracks. Yeah. So it's interesting now that we have Tomorrow Comes Today live, we kind of might have a better idea of what that song sounded like in the studio to begin with, look at, like live drums. Yeah, I think the consensus would probably be not as good. <laughs> no, it just it felt, <laughs> felt a little flat, felt a little weak. Maybe it'll sound different in person. Maybe it was a matter of how the drums were mixed, which, you know, could easily be the case. Uh, up next was Rhinestone Eyes. Which sounded pretty good. It sounded pretty good. There was a little bit of lyrical improvising, but I actually think he, he, he stuck to the book more than I was expecting, probably. Although, his go-to substitute line was just to throw in a factories far away whenever he was confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coming up next was Charger. Now, we were a little bit disappointed, Trevor, because there were some apparently unfounded rumors that Grace Jones had been seen wandering about the campus uh, of Dreamland before the show. So, Wouldn't that have been something? All of us watching live on the Hallelujah Monkeys Discord were sort of amped up for the possibility of a Grace Jones live performance. Didn't happen. Yeah, yeah it was a bummer. I mean, but... Still an electrifying performance. Damon went out into the crowd, got all rock star with it. Um, he went, let me feel you. <laughs> Very cool. Really good. But next we should talk about the fact that they played Moments. With uh, Paz the Noose there. Didn't bother bringing out the rest of De La Soul. Because it's really a Paz solo track. But that's yeah. actually kind of cool because Feel Good Inc., as we know, is a, is a more or less a Trugoy show. So when you do both in one set, you really do kind of get the best of both worlds you know what i mean yeah that's true now right here is when a little bit of drama happens Trevor. right because um they were trying to play strobe light but it it wasn't quite coming together yet yeah he just says peven isn't here so we're gonna move on (laughs) right i mean he was on the stage a couple minutes ago but now he seems to have vanished well perhaps we'll 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 find out the source of this drama a little later on in the set right because there was a little bit of an arc to it but first let's uh do you, is there anything else you want to say about um submission because they played that next yeah i thought both performances were really solid but i was really transfixed by kalela's i thought i thought her performance was really breathtaking yeah she held it down uh speaking of great performances i i always love seeing jamie principal uh tear up sex murder party <laughs> Like it's so good. He is a joy live. During David's hook, he goes full hype, man. He's like, I don't think, think they, they hear you. you. It's so good. <laughs> I loved it. I would love if for a few dates they just let JV Principal come out and hype man the whole show. I would be I would not be complaining. <laughs> but let's talk briefly about Zebra Katz's outfit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that, that there were three highlight outfits for me tonight, and this was number one with a bullet. Uh 
Zebra Cats came out wearing a a onesie, a metallic onesie with a slit in the chest. And then over his face, he wore a mesh bag and then hair that was made of, like, mop material. And he rocked it. He rocked it all. <laughs> he looked amazing. He looked like an amazing, uh, glamorous space alien. This was an early set highlight for me. I thought, I thought this whole performance was really fun. Honestly, if you had told me that, like, Sex Murder Party was going to rule live, I probably would have been a little skeptical. Because I, I still do think it might be one of the weaker cuts on humans. But, man, it takes, like, a whole nother life on when you play it live. Oh, fucking for sure. Like, on the album, it, it there it's very sort of utilitarian. Like, it yep. serves a purpose on the album. Exactly. But live, it, it, it explodes. Yeah. Uh, speaking of explosions, let's talk about She's My Caller. Always good live. Every performance I've seen is, has been really on point. To me, in this human's material, the moment when Callie Uchis comes on stage is, like, one of the moments to look forward to. Definitely. Because you never know what kind of crazy glittery 1960s bullshit she's going to be wearing which Mm -hmm. is always fun Mm -hmm. uh i would describe her outfit this time as being like the dress that a mermaid would be wearing after a sea witch gave her legs (laughs) uh and and also just because again that flirtatious chemistry yep it's always fun to watch between her and david yeah it's very it's very sexy trevor (laughs) Please never say that again. Watching watching those two really ham it up together during She's My Caller is a highlight for me. Something that's not very fun and sexy, though, at least I think so, El Manana. Damon really oversold this one a little bit, I think. At this point, though, El Manana Live is almost like kind of like a bathroom break for me. It does feel like a box is being ticked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. How do you feel about Dirty Harry, the next song? I, the thought, I thought this was a pretty good rendition of it. I always love seeing the, the image of those kids, the Jamie Hewlett's kids in the background. That's always fun. Yes, it's almost like Jamie Hewlett by way of Charlie Brown and the Peanuts. You know? Pretty much, yeah. And I, I liked all of the um, uh, additional arrangements they added to this one. I really wasn't too fond of uh, Booty Brown's performance, though. I feel like the version of that performance that he does on Demon Days Live, he's also screaming so loud that he's like three octaves higher than his normal voice. But it's like, your mic is on, dude. The energy of that performance swallows his performance a little bit better than this one, I thought. Right. Uh, where there's a, there were a couple of moments in this version of Dirty Harry where he kind of felt alone on that stage to Yeah, me. he was just, just <laughs> screaming at the top of his lungs, though. I don't know. I wasn't super into it. Yeah, not my fave uh, guest performance of the night. And speaking of guest performances... This next one didn't have any. <laughs> Let me out, featuring nobody. Weird, right? They couldn't get Pusha T. No Pusha. I mean, I know Mavis is a, is usually not a, in the cards, right? Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I was pretty sure Pusha was going to be there. I almost feel like this this could have been skippable. I, this was probably the lower moment of the night for me because you know a lot of people really love Live Let Me Out, Trevor. That has I don't that. understand it. That guitar they had, the electric guitar, sounds awful and it has that whole extended outro i think yeah i think it totally ruins what is great about this track which is that it feels cramped and paranoid totally those live drums just don't sound good on it it sounds plotting i don't know so next they played um andromeda which is i think always good live yeah i love the bond when the bongos come in at the end i'm like "Mm, yeah this is good (laughs) then just like on humans they went into uh busted in blue after that i got very yeah i got very teary-eyed uh with busted in blue I thought it was a really, really beautiful performance. Kalila doing it live kind of like nailed down what a big part she is of this song, you know? Yeah, and it, it just it works so well back to back with Andromeda, even in a live setting. And after that, we finally got strobe light. So in between, we found out he got food sick, and apparently he wasn't the only one. He later posted on Twitter that he ate something bad and that there were multiple staff at uh, at Demon Days Festival who who... We're suffering, too. You cannot trust music festival food. Don't trust that. That's rule number one. But, boy, this was a fuck. He played through the pain. Like, yeah. this dude left it all on the field. Strobe Light is fucking sick live. I've thought that ever since uh, they released that radio session of it they did. And then we had Kids with Guns, Trevor. Yeah, Kids with Guns. For some reason, I wasn't super enthusiastic about seeing this one pop up. Dude, I was so excited by the end of it, though. I thought... I thought the the fever pitch the crescendo that they reached when Saya Adelaika and the the bassist was like lying on his back convulsing on the ground and and fucking Jeff Wooten was like going insane on his electric electric guitar he was playing like a, a he was shredding like it was a fucking flying V that guy they really do take this one to another kind of stratosphere live I definitely agree with that like to me the end of Kids with Guns is about to launch us into the the strongest part of this whole set for me you think really. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because next they play Dare. This was fascinating. And Sean Ryder was there, which I would not have expected. Sean Ryder apparently clean and sober since 2011. Interesting. I mean, you can tell. It's definitely different from his performances at uh, Demon Days Live. (laughs) Yes. uh, Depending on whether you are a a rubbernecker who likes to look at train wrecks or not, this was probably the best live version of Dare, just in terms of Sean Ryder actually fulfilling his duties. It was the tightest by far. Roses was wearing a very cool outfit too, Trevor. She had a she had like some fishnets going on. She kinda looked like she was in a Bob Fosse production or something. Yep, that's accurate. It was cool seeing those two together because they always have surprising amount of like sibling chemistry almost, Roses and, and Sean. It was just such a surprise to see him actually there because I would have like if you'd asked me, I would have bet money that he was just gonna be that head on the screen from the music video. I don't predict that we'll see a lot of him on the tour. Yeah, I would doubt it. Then after that, Trevor. After that, they played Out of Body. And there is some stuff we should talk about on this track, right? Yes, let's talk about the good first. Okay, yeah. Kilo Kish. Amazing. Killed it. Incredible sing this live. So good. Best facial expressions in the game. Yeah. She's so much fun. Mm -hmm. I think she had intended to wear the same black linen suit that she had wore in her solo performance. But but she came out in this very bright green outfit. Yeah, because in her solo performance, she accidentally ripped it to shreds while being an insane person. <laughs> but yeah, she fucking killed it. And then Zebra Cast was really fun doing his hook. And mm-hmm. then, holy shit, Imani Vancha. Oh my holy god. Holy shit. Wow. wow. <laughs> she was singing like she was first chair in a, in a church choir during the rapture. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she went balls out i've been waiting so long to see how they would do this part of the song live because like i've told you it sounds less like a band performing and more like damon just spinning a house record but man right. it was it was really cool to see that realized that imani Vonch, the the high note that she hits might be the crescendo of the demon days festival yeah like, i i fucking felt it all up and down my spine i mean and it's, in my it's the high point of humans the album if you ask me and it was cool to see it play like the same kind of role here i love that this is so far back in the set as it should be uh but let's talk about the disappointing thing about this because there was no damon verse at the end he's he's being shy about about showing us his rapping he is a little bit i mean like between this and something we'll talk about later he does the verses on um the charger which is basically the same thing fingers crossed we're going to see a lot more of Out of Body Live uh, on the tour. I hope so, dude. And maybe, maybe we'll see. Maybe he'll he'll build up a little bit of courage and yeah. we'll eventually get yeah. that Damon first. This is where I also wanted to talk about that great little footage we got. I don't know where it was from, but Damon in the audience at a performance of Out of Body at one of the shows they've done in the past. I think it was at the St. Albans show. This made me so happy because I'm not sure if you remember, but this is the exact kind of image I like ascribed to this song back when we did our little um bonus episode our first take on humans and it was just unreal for me to see it kind of realized actually happening in front of your eyes yeah if you haven't seen that clip it's it's i the word that i would use to describe damon albarn in the clip is adorable yeah yeah <laughs> he got he gets into the crowd not even like a rock star he just gets into the crowd like he's a gorillas fan kind yep. of he's like singing along to kylo kish's verse jumping around and he looks like he's so excited to be there love it it's great seeing him <laughs> like this honestly fuck yeah yeah and then you, you know what happened next trevor they played a song neither you and i have never heard before and I did watch it. I didn't tune out. Yeah, I watched it too, of course. I mean, you had to if you were watching this entire performance. And you know what? It was a banger. Can I, can I read my notes? Go ahead. Yeah, we're talking about um, Garage or Garage Palace, by the way. I'll read you my notes. Uh, here they are. There's four, there's four lines. The first line says, Ah! <laughs> and then the second line says, Holy shit! <laughs> and then the third line says, Glitter freezes back. <laughs> no. <laughs> The fourth line says, Little Sims, with four exclamation park okay. points. And then the last line says, Little Sims, with seven exclamation points. <laughs> didn't, didn't double and go full eight, huh? <laughs> that was my reaction. This was a really good one. It's going to be released as a B-side in the Super Deluxe version, and I can't wait to hear the studio version. Garage Palace, I don't even know what to say about it. Like, it washed over me. Like, I, I didn't study it because it was unstudyable. Yeah, you had to live in the moment. Full I mean, that's maybe the fastest I've ever heard her rap. I've listened to her debut album. She's fucking, she goes off. She did a sure. great job. Yeah, it was really sick. And then, uh, and then we get to the set closer. Yeah, they closed with We Got the Power, that kind of extended version where they do a little build up at the beginning instead of just screaming the title of the song right off the bat. Tell me if you agree with this, Trevor. I thought this sounded 
way better than the other two live versions we've heard. Uh, it didn't do necessarily anything more for me than it than those other ones did. Honestly, I thought I thought it had so much more energy and sounded way fuller than the uh, the Graham Norton one and the Printworks one that have been previously released. I don't know what that was. It might have just been the emotion of the giant set of craziness that I'd just been through. Possibly, yeah. Jenny Beth, that should be mentioned, was a real fucking rock star champion, and she stood up in the crowd. She's really good. She's always really good. And then we would be remiss, of course, if we didn't mention our... Sam Eglinton. Our good, handsome, lucky, smart, pretty boy. <laughs> Sam Eglinton. Bring that bell. <laughs> Bring that bell. Do you think... What are the odds, Trevor, that, that he goes on tour with them? <laughs> I really hope we get to see him. Not only that we get to see him, I hope we get to catch him backstage and we get to interview him for the podcast real quick. The fact that he's on stage looking like a dork, smiling like an idiot, <laughs> ringing that bell is still my favorite thing about We Got the Power Live. It's because, it's, it's because he could be any one of us, you know what I mean? Exactly. He was like an interning assistant. You know, I think he's like 19 or 20. Yeah. They didn't do any kind of a long, you know, walk off stage, wait for the We Want Gorillas chant thing. They nah. just got... Yeah. They lights outed and then went straight into the encore. Which was pretty cool. It started off with a song um, that we absolutely need to talk about in depth, I think. In fact, let's uh, let's pause our, our Demon Days live review. Right, and get into a little mini track review because we have a new gorilla song to talk about. Sleeping Powder. It was released on Thursday, June 8th to YouTube through the Gorillas mobile app. And it's not technically by Gorillas. It's, as the video says, by 2D. So the whole fall lore thing is back in a big way. Oh, this to me totally confirms uh, that one listener who, who I believe his name is Andy, who uh, recorded his his theory that the fall was 2D's solo album that he made while on tour. Yep, definitely. This this has such a fall sound. First, hang on, hang on. Let's let's give a little bit of context here. Okay. Because I remember when this dropped, you, your first question to me was. What the fuck is this? <laughs> as, as I often, a uh, question I often pose you on this podcast. So we do have some answers. So at Brixton, which was the last of the three warm up gigs that the band played before this festival, right? Damon premiered this song live and he gave a little talk up. I, I, I have it in our notes. Do you want to read it? Sure. He says, I'm going to go into the cartoon narrative of this whole thing, Gash? which is already Gash? fucking super exciting. Bombshell? What? <laughs> yeah. 2D felt like he was maybe underrepresented on humans a bit. It wasn't a problem, just maybe I was a bit too generous, you know? So he thought he'd do the song just by himself and the video just with him, not to tell anyone else, not to tell Murdoch, secret. And we thought, well, you know, we'd show you the video and the song all at the same time. So what do you think? It, it might be a bit rough around the edges because he wrote the song on Monday and made the video on Wednesday. What? Okay, so this is so the fall. This is so the fall. It's also adorable. It's also so adorable. So, okay, here's my here's my official theory about what exactly Sleeping Powder is, Trevor. I think this weekend, like Sunday night or so, Damon and Jamie were, were chatting a bit. One of them said, hey, you've got your iPad. I've got my motion capture suits. Like, turnaround has never been faster for Gorilla's material. What if... Right? What if you write a song, record it that day, and then the next day I'll make a video of it, and then we'll fucking play it at our giant festival in front of thousands of people? Just a... What do you think I was? Just a kind of a demonstration of their new powers? Yes. And like a personal challenge between two old friends. That's my guess. That's pretty sick. I like thinking about that. And fucking... That's a huge moment. Like, what... What is this band now where something like that can fucking happen, Trevor? Like, Right? I mean, this isn't totally unprecedented because, like, you know, of course they saved this for the weekend after we did our little rarities episode because <laughs> this song right? would totally have a home there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I like to think that maybe Damon was listening and going like, oh, yeah, you know, this is the thing I used to do. <laughs> I used to just throw out little unfinished songs. Maybe uh, I'll do I that hope, again. I hope that we were, yeah. I hope yeah. that we were the instigating forest, Trevor. Let's talk about the video first. <laughs> <laughs> sure. My main question is, do you think that was Damon in the motion capture After suit? After watching the Demon Days live performance, yes, definitely. It's very possible. I'm not going to give a conclusive answer because I have no idea, but the, I think it's very possible. Okay, if you haven't seen Sleeping Powder video, first of all, pause the shit and go watch it. It's, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, it is 2D dancing like a fucking goon. <laughs> like, yeah. like the whitest goon in the world. And then, meanwhile, when they fucking do it live, they have the video projected 
on the screen behind him. And then David is dancing almost exactly the same way as 2D. Here's my favorite thing about the performance of it. Damon sings the chorus, like the, the opening hook. And then when the verse comes in, he stops abruptly and gestures to the screen where 2D is singing. And he goes like, he's like, here you go. I'm not even mad that he's not rapping. It's so much fun. It feels like I, it yeah. feels like he's giving 2D like his grand moment in the sun, you know? Really, really interesting. <laughs> this whole thing, I feel like, sets a precedent. Like, everything's on the table now. Anything goes. Oh, like, who knows sure. what Gorillaz is going to do next. This was so fast that there isn't even, like, copyright information available. People keep saying, like, what is this going to be on Spotify? And I would imagine that the answer is, uh, it'll take a bit, because... The whole fucking legal side of these things is, moves a lot slower than apparently animating a gorilla's music video takes now, which is fucking amazing. Uh, let's talk about the song. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty fun. Nothing super special, but definitely a good time. The hook is, is I, I would hesitate to call this song anthemic, and yet I find that hook oddly like sing alongable. Mm-hmm. I, when I hear Sleeping Powder, I have a hard time not wanting to sing along with that hook. I also really like the harpsichord that that uh, kicks it off. Makes a comeback from uh, Sex Murder Party. Makes a comeback from Sex Murder Party. And again, the fact that this kind of starts in this acoustic folk pick place and then turns into this like little synth pop jam makes it feel very folly to me. You know, almost sounds like um, Damon's part of Do You Thing by way of the fall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that the track is a lot of fun. And if they keep doing things like this throughout the tour. Oh shit, yes. That'll be so much fun. Like yeah. what if in lieu of the fall two we had like a little five song and video EP of like songs that that Damon made on a whim and Jamie made a little music video for while they're on tour. That would be f- I definitely I wouldn't complain. Oh, that'd be so cool. That'd be so cool. I give it ten Damon doing the I'm a little teapot <laughs> dance out of ten. <laughs> It was great. <laughs> nothing super, nothing really super noteworthy about uh, the rest of the encore, I think, though, except for uh, the great version of uh, Clint Eastwood they played. Okay, yeah, so they let, we'll blow through it. They did Feel Good Inc. I mean, as as expected, Maceo did the laugh like his life depended on it, which was great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Clint Eastwood happened. We were in the chat, so I would spoiled myself a little bit by looking at, at some of the warm-up gig set lists. Um, okay. And I was like, I know what we're getting. We're going to get a version of Clint Eastwood with Kano and Vince Staples, because that's what they did last night in Brixton. They wouldn't have had Vince Staples come and rehearse Clint Eastwood with them if he wasn't going to do it in the show. Surprisingly, though, that's not what we got. But then I said, you know what would be the ultimate Phase 4 version of Clint Eastwood? And Trevor, I still stand behind this. The ultimate Phase 4 version of Clint Eastwood would be one verse by Kylo Kish yes, and one verse by Little Sims. And you know what? You ended up getting half of that. Holy shit, Little Sims came out and did an amazing verse. One of, I think, the best live guest appearances on Clint Eastwood, if not the best. If not the best, but they did like a fucking beat switch when Little Sims came out, which is like really jarring because you Clint Eastwood, you sort of think of being on auto, autopilot in a way, you know? Yeah. But they kind of like switched it up and then Little Sims came out and like she and Kato were kind of call and responsing at the end of her verse. It was amazing. It was great. It was great. Anyway. After that, they played. Uh, they closed out the set with uh, "Don't Get Lost in Heaven" and "Demon Days," which you know, pretty straightforward reading. Not not super exciting, uh, especially because we had that really transcendent version from "Demon Days Live" that I think will probably never really be uh, bested. Right. Some some good Damon moments here, though. So, yeah. Well, there was the big moment, the big Bono moment at the end of the set, Trevor. I'm so glad you said it, so I don't have to. <laughs> when he put the leather pants on. <laughs> I knew he'd do it. I knew he'd do it. During the extended instrumental section of Demon Days, uh, Damon walked out to the lip of the stage, and he said, two words for you. And then he put one (laughs) finger in the air, and he said, the first one is unity. And then he put a second finger in the air, making a peace sign, and said, and through unity, we find love. And you know, if he has been listening to Halloween Monkeys, he should know by now you're supposed to come up with three words. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point, yeah. Trevor. But that was so much fun because, again, like I said, this was a ham sandwich. It, it started with this ridiculous uh, un, unzipping <clears throat> of the, the black robe and it ended with him flashing a peace sign and telling us that unity and love is the answer to everything. <laughs> That's our boy. That's 
our boy. That was the Demon Days Live Festival. What a time to be a Gorillaz fan, Trevor. Are, are we done talking about the news? I feel like that's the longest we've ever spent on the news. Like I said, this is was not really the news. This was this is yeah, this yeah. is like a two subject episode this week. You know what this I mean? This was this was Hallelujah Monkeys vicariously go to the demon days festival let's get into the main event trevor let's sit down at the round table and talk about our top 10 gorilla songs and our album power rankings trevor it's the biggest night in hollywood and all the stars are out it's time it's time for us to finally lay it all out on the table have you been stressing this? I've been a little bit anxious. I've been trying not to give you anything. I, I kind of took my my heart out of the the process. I I, I was very Nazi like in my uh, assessment of of who is better than who. You know, we're gonna start. We have two main events, right? Yes, we are going to kind of rank the uh, studio albums and see how they stack up against each other in our opinions, and then we're going to get into our top ten gorillas tracks. And who knows? There there could be some there blood could fly there could be some real i'm perfectly ready to tear into you about some of your choices and by the way it's not just us there's a third presenter tonight it's you it's me and it's the listeners all you people out there at home many of you i don't have the number in front of me i think it was somewhere around 50 of you sent in your top 10 gorilla songs and your album rankings and god bless you because as trevor and i learned over the last week that's not the easiest thing to put together do you want to get into it let's get into it let's do we just get into it let's, let's do, do it. our let's... album rankings number seven the worst gorilla studio album g sides I absolutely agree. That is also my number seven. Mic drop! I, you know what? I don't think it would have been uh, when this when this show started. I think I would have put the fall at seven. Interesting. I yeah. But we'll upon reevaluating both of them, I gotta say that well, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Mm-hmm. G sides was probably always going to be last place for me. They learned from the mistakes they made here, though. I think when they decided to compile some more B sides for a later release, though. So I think I think it's it's good. How about I lead off with number six? Because I think I'm about to blow your mind here. Okay, I'm very, I'm very worried about what's going to happen. Trevor, what's your number six? My sixth favorite album, Gorilla's self-titled debut. That is outrageous! We weren't expecting that, were you? That's fucking outrageous, Trevor. <laughs> Neither was I, Dylan. Holy I gotta tell you. shit. When I, when I stacked up everything against each other, I was very surprised to see how low this one has fallen on that my list. That is so insane. I had a, I had a <laughs> premonition that it might be below D-side, but... I would have never. This is. We'll talk about. We'll talk about the later albums, but just let's talk about this, okay? This is you know a what? betrayal. <laughs> now you know how I fucking feel. <laughs> Anyways, I just looking at it. I just don't like too many of these songs that much anymore. Then there are just total duds like Soundcheck. Yeah, I. You know, I think in reevaluating this album, I probably came away with a warmer glow than a rosier glow than I was expecting to have. With Interesting, it. you know. There were there was a time in my life where I would have told you this was my favorite Gorillaz album, if nothing else, because of the kind of loose, fun nature. In retrospect, it just kind of feels like Damon testing the waters. Um, my second worst Gorillaz album, and the second worst Gorillaz album, let's face it, is The Fall. Come on, The Fall, Trevor. You're insane. You're an insane Spe- man. <laughs> Speaking of testing the waters, yeah, I mean, this is another uh, this is another case of Damon figuring out what he wants to do with this band at the moment, but. I don't know. I'm I'm going to be honest with you. The Fall is my uh, number five. The Fall is your number five, so let's talk about it now. The Fall is Damon's Office Hours, the album. That's <laughs> the last I have to say about it. See, and I see it as um, the uh, cosmic and mystical journey into Damon's very soul. I love your fan read of it, but... It- I mean, it's it's On the Road meets Dante's Inferno. How can you, like... How can not like not at least be in your top five? It's the TPS reports of Gorillaz albums. Okay, my number five is D sides. It did not overtake uh, any of the the official studio centerpiece the proper Gorillaz studio album for recordings. Me. Okay, that's fair. Um, that's fair. I can I can feel D sides in this spot, but it's very strong, and I think it's the one that probably changed the least for me in reevaluating it with you in this podcast, Trevor. I feel like mm-hmm. I came into D sides feeling one way about D-Sides, I left D-Sides feeling the same way. I agree with that, and D-Sides is actually my number four. My number four, Trevor, was a point of much contention. In fact, you'll recall that one of our album review uh, episodes was quite torturous for me. I had to spend a week really trying to digest one of the main Gorillaz albums, and ultimately, I have come away and decided that Plastic Beach is 
the worst of the phase centerpiece albums for me. Plastic Beach is my number three. So here's, here's my thinking. Here's ultimately why I ranked it lower than the others. I think that my number three album, which we'll get to in a second, the high points of it, I like roughly as much as the high points of Plastic Beach, but the low points of Plastic Beach remain ready skippable tracks for me. Okay, I feel that. Because of that, Plastic Beach, while still a great album, saddles the number four position. Your th- number three is Plastic Beach, Trevor? It is, and my favorite thing about this record is that this is the darkest chapter in uh the gorilla's story i think i mean just well certainly behind the scenes it's it's uh, behind the scenes and in the band in the lore the band is fractured noodle's been replaced by a robot russell's not in the band anymore and in real life i mean there's just so much tension there behind like the least successful gorilla's album the first kind of relatively unsuccessful gorilla's album i think i think damon and jamie might have been expecting this one to do a little more than it did and it didn't and that kind of resulted in the darkest chapter in gorillas and it's very interesting to go back and look at it in some ways it very nearly resulted in the destruction of the project entirely almost yeah and i mean hey how can an album that almost destroys your band not be great that's true and it's a, it's an important uh stop on the road my number three is the self-titled i think when we started this project but the self-titled probably would have been my number four but like i said the the low points of of this album are not skips for me even now the distance between self-titled and plastic plastic beach for me are it's very small it's a hair's length for sure that's how i feel about my uh top two okay i'm gonna i have an idea of what this is gonna be and of course, I have an idea about yours because there's only two albums we haven't named yet. Right. Both of us. So my number two, Demon Days. Wow. I was not expecting that. I'm very excited. Really? I'm very happy. Interesting. Now, Demon Days is still my favorite record of all time. But if we're talking about Gorillaz albums, it is my second favorite Gorillaz album. Can you do a better, I kind of know what you mean, but can you, can you flesh out what you mean for the listening audience by that i think demon days has is a stronger set of songs i think i don't know just the way they are composed and arranged clicks with me a little more i i almost like the i kind of like the concept even more too just kind of an album made by somebody who is just so like so convinced that the world is ending at this moment that like something is coming for us and just yeah just the way that translates to this album i really love that and I don't know. It's just, it's a, a but it's a stronger, I, I hate saying this, it's almost a stronger Damon Albarn album than it is a Gorillaz album. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know how I feel. <sighs> yeah, I, I think I got to disagree with you on that. To me, let's just, I'll get it out right now. My number two is Humans. My number one is Demon Days. The, okay, my number one is, of course, Humans. Yeah. That's the only one left. So the, yeah. the difference between these two albums to me, I, I agree with what a lot of, a lot about what you're saying. I think that the urgency of Demon Days and, and how real the end of the world felt to Damon is very different from what we got on Humans, where where Humans was made about a parallel Earth that turned out to be our Earth, which makes it fascinating, makes it a very interesting document, makes it unlike any other album that's ever been released, for sure. That gives Humans a power that is singular in the Gorillaz discography. But I think the reason that I stick with, with Demon Days is, uh, is I'm not even going to say the focus, because I think Humans, in spite of being quite long, is quite focused. But the restraint of demon days uh i i I do feel that i give an edge over the kind of maximalist approach of humans which i also definitely like these two albums are fucking great i don't think you and i are just in any disagreement about that no and here's here's the way i see it okay here's the relationship between demon days and humans because i think they are very closely related and i think that's probably why they're both of our top twos i see demon days as the promise of what gorillas can be in the future this is the first time that Damon kind of used them as a band about the end of the world. Right. Like, you know, in the first one, they were a ba- band about taking down the music industry. The form of gorillas that Damon almost teased when accepting that MTV award, where he says, like, these awards aren't important, you know, like, the state of our planet and our future is important. This is where Damon first took that musical step into turning gorillas into that. And Humans is, I think, the culmination of the decision to turn gorillas into that kind of project. It's the first chapter of a book versus the last chapter of the book. They're both very strong. But I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting Demon Days higher. Very close, though. Neck and neck. I'll probably go back and forth throughout the rest of my life. Trevor, are you familiar with the scientific theory of emergent intelligence? Um, Remind me of what that is. Okay, so the idea is if you crowdsource an average, you'll get closer to the truth than any one individual guest. This is demonstrable, Trevor, when you see, like, a guess how many jelly beans are in a jar set up. 
Sure, I'm following. If you average out all of the guesses, like 99 times out of 100, this is documentable in science, the average guess is going to be closer than any one individual guess. It's very eerie. Uh, It's very difficult to understand. People use it to sort of liken collective human intelligence to collective ant intelligence. Interesting. Hopefully today on this episode, we will see a demonstration of emergent intelligence. Maybe both of our listeners are fucking bullshit, Trevor. Maybe. I mean, maybe, like, I know we do have a lot of Fall fans out there. (laughs) It's true, we do have some Fall fans. This is going to be the listener poll results of the rankings of the Gorillaz album. I'm going to go through them one at a time and give you a little bit of a Extra data trivia as I go. All right, I'm. For, I'm. I've been looking forward to hear this. So hit me with it. You should know first, Trevor, how I I weighted the votes. Okay. Yeah. So because you did put a lot of effort and painstaking care into this. <laughs> yes, I helped. I, I solicited the help of a, a listener friend of ours who has a little bit more understanding of statistics than me to figure out how to do this in a way that would be representative and fair. Uh, for the album, I went kind of I. I did the most obvious way you could you could weight these, which is for every number one slot, uh, I gave that album seven points. For every uh, number seven slot, I gave that album one point. So obviously, gotcha. it counts down from there. Your number two is worth six, and your number three is worth five. That way, I've seen this system used before, and it's pretty 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 effective. And and I don't feel bad about the result we have, although it is very interesting. It is very interesting. All right. Okay. All right, so hit me with it, yeah. Coming in at number seven, G-Side with 52 points. So we nailed that one. We nailed that one. The highest anybody ranked this, Trevor, was number four, and only one listener ranked it that high. What are they thinking? They like 1-2-D-3. Coming in at number six, Trevor, The Fall with 77 points. Doesn't surprise me. This was the only album that was ranked every place by at least one listener. Somebody made it their number one, number two, number three, all the way down the line. What a, what a little interesting record this is to kind of um, like generate such a varied emotional response from people. I know, for sure. And, and I love the fact that, that somebody who listens to our podcast considers this to be their number one, their number two, their number three. It's all things to all people. I think that's very representative of what the fall is. And number five, Trevor... D sides with 103 points. One listener called this their second favorite. One listener called it their least favorite, and most fell somewhere between. That that pretty much uh, checks out for me. I mean, honestly, there was probably a point in my life where I was feeling a little, you know, contradictory, and I probably would have told people that this was my favorite Gorillaz album. Then you would have been an outlier because again, we bit. had we had one person call it number two, but nobody called it their number one favorite Gorillaz album. But it did very respectable with 103 points. Do you want to you want to fathom and guess what number four is? I think number four is going to be. Although I'm ready to be shocked, I think it's going to be the self-titled. And you are correct. There you go. Not only is it ranked number fourth, it was overwhelmingly individually ranked as people's number four Gorillaz album. Doesn't surprise me. Just doesn't. Like, a vast majority of people called this their number four Gorillaz album. Number three, Trevor, is Humans with 165. Okay. Okay. I feel like now that we're in the top three, anything goes. Only two people rank this as their favorite Gorillaz album. They're my guys. They're my guys. Okay, Trevor, we're in the top two now. Okay, so we're down to Demon Days and Plastic Beach. Now, what would you say, what were you expecting to see as number two? Well, I got to watch this this story develop over the week. Okay. Like, when you were first toying around with this idea, though, like, what was what were the top two looking like for you? What would you have said? I feel like most of our listeners found this band in phase three. Me too. So it would not surprise me if Demon Days came in at second, despite, you know, a lot of people still finding that to be the band's magnum opus. And one week into the polls, Plastic Beach was running away with this vote. Okay. How did it end up finishing, though? It ended up finishing as number one, but only by two points. And I have holy some, shit. I have some interesting data for you, Trevor. Okay. More people ranked Demon Days as their number one Gorillaz album than Plastic Beach. But a handful of people do not like Demon Days and ranked it very low. Which has always surprised me. I don't understand. Like, it seems a little polarizing, right? You've got a bunch of people who, like, think that this is, like, this was the band at their peak. But then there are another group of people who just, it doesn't seem to click for them. They think it's boring. I hear the word boring thrown around a lot. Yeah. 
And and it is very interesting that Plastic Beach you did not see get ranked any lower than than third usually. Like me ranking it fourth makes me a bit of an outlier. Like you said, I I feel like this is probably the a lot of people's first Gorillaz album, so it doesn't surprise me that it's very special to people. But more of our listeners ranked it as number two than ranked it as number one. Uh, so so once again, Plastic Beach wins for its consistency of support, but individual number one rankings, Demon Days beat it out. The people have spoken. The people have spoken, and now we will speak about about songs. our top ten gorillas songs. I'm I'm very curious about what's going to happen uh, in this in this ranking, Trevor. So you started us off with the uh, album rankings. Why don't you let me uh, go first and tell you what my tenth favorite gorilla song is? All right, I'm very excited and, and nervous. Let's hear it. My number ten favorite gorilla song is. Do your thing. Do your thing. That's awesome. Do your thing. That's so cool. I'm very excited to hear that on your list. Uh, Honestly, it's... might have even been higher. Let's admit, gorillas aren't the best part of this song. Nobody drops the ball. Right. But, but, but somebody, Andre runs away somebody holds onto it very tightly. Yes, And then true. makes like 50,000 <laughs> slam dunks in a row. But I do think gorillas are giving them a launch pad to do that and, and, totally. and deserve a lot of credit for that. And there is absolutely nothing like it in the rest of the band's catalog either. No, for sure. The same can be said for my number 10, Trevor, which was the hardest choice on this list for me. I had about five songs vying for this number 10 spot, and what I did was I two by I one by one them against in every combination. Do I like this one better than this one? Do I like this one better than this one? And by the time... That's what power rankings are all about. By the, by the end of that process, it was determined that my 10th favorite Gorillaz song is Hip Albatross. Wow, I'm really fucking shocked by that, honestly, dude. I'm also a little bit surprised by that. It took down some heavy hitters, and uh, I think nostalgia has a lot to do with this. This was a song... I mean, this is basically this is basically like saying that your 10th favorite Gorilla song is uh, watching Day of the Dead half asleep while Damon plays guitar. And you know what happens? When I listen to this song, Trevor, I see 12-year-old Dylan Flynn with his head- headphones on hunched over his disc man and his acoustic guitar trying to learn how to play this guitar part. And it fills me with a warmth and a nostalgia that is so powerful that... Uh, how can you beat that kind of that feeling? That Hip Albatross is... I'm proud to call it my 10th favorite Gorilla song. Yeah. So what about your ninth favorite Gorilla <laughs> song? <laughs> hey, Trevor. <laughs> what? Did you know that sometimes Gorillas got the bass, y'all? <laughs> oh, no. This made it on your list? This yours is not looking good <laughs> so far, my friend. M one A one, my number nine. Boy, I wish I was. I wish that I was a cooler person than this, Trevor. Me too. But uh, but I'm not, and I gotta be honest. I can't make a cool list that makes me sound like a cool guy. I gotta I gotta make an honest list, and honestly, I fucking jam out to this song. I jam out to it so hard. Did you kind of go into this shooting for a spread across their catalog, or was it just simply? What songs jump out uh, at me first? Kind of. I think I got the first five on the list just knowing that these are five of my favorite Gorilla songs. And then filling it out, I okay. kind of went back to our reviews and looked at, like, what did I pick as my favorites and, and sort of a half-and-half half effort. I was going for a kind of spread with mine, and I think I, it ended up working out to be a good uh, combination of the two. But it was kind of a little tough for me to weigh some tracks from Humans against the older stuff just because, you know, I haven't formed an emotional attachment to some of the newer stuff that I have with a lot of the older that makes sense. I think that was also reflected in a lot of the listener rankings. You saw you saw people a little bit more hesitant to rank human songs higher. Yeah, and I understand that. But there were a couple that I just felt like had to be on there. Andromeda is one of them at number nine. Awesome. I'm super happy to hear that. Andromeda is a, is a, a great song. I don't know if we consider it a single, but if it is, it's up there in the in the Gorilla Singles canon for me. Glad to hear it. It's very emotional. It's very personal. Yeah, all of the emotional and personal backstory to this one really pushes it ahead of a, a lot of the other uh, human songs that maybe I even almost enjoy more musically, but I don't know. This feels like the special one. That's so cool. I'm happy to hear it. I yeah. really I approve of your of your list so far, perhaps even more than my own, although mine is, <laughs> is my own. It belongs to me. Mine is the more objectively correct, as usual. <laughs> uh, do you want to hear about my eighth favorite Gorilla yeah, song? Yeah, tell me about it may not be as fond of uh, the self-titled as I used to be, but I still really love Slow Country. Oh, man. Slow Country was it was definitely in, in contention for my top ten. I love this song. It's so beautiful. One of the prettiest pieces of music Damon has ever recorded, I think. Just there's something so airy and breezy, not just because of, you know, that sample at the beginning. It's just really nice. It's perfectly bittersweet. There's just the right mix of emotions on this one, and 
Damon's vocal performance is just beautiful. I think in our episode where we reviewed this, you really pointed out his little ad lib at the end is one of the like, prettiest, oh breeziest moments on the on the self titled. I was actually trying to think in if his entire career. I, yeah, I was trying to think if there's a, a prettier moment on a gorilla song. Like I think the I think the choral vamp at the end of "Don't Get Lost in Heaven" is very pretty, but not quite as pretty. So what's your number eight? My number eight, making uh, its first Plastic Beach appearance on my list, is Some Kind of Nature, featuring Lou Reed. Hey, cool. My boy Lou Reed made it onto the list. I don't know. Just th- something about the, the little synth woodwind line in that song perfectly encapsulates what is good and limited about Damon's production. Like, it's so charming and it's so corny, and uh, and Lou, I think, is, holds the song down. Yeah. Pretty easy pick for me. I love Lou on this one. Really good. My number seven, Trevor, is Spitting Out the Demons from D Side. Yeah, I know you're really into this one. Fucking love the song. It's jam. Really good one. It's probably even more than M1A1. Is this is like my dumbing out gorilla song? This is fucking. I go into a fugue state when this song comes on. I love it. Like you said, it's a jam. That's like the best way I can describe it. I mean, it's got some of the best bass work in a gorilla song some really fucking sick guitar work and damon's vocals how can you argue with that so good doing his kind of take on bob marley and the whalers amazing so good yeah um my number seven first plastic beach appearance you might not be happy about this one but it's rhinestone eyes i'm not surprised i'm not surprised this one is just such a such a good distillation of the plastic beach aesthetic for me you know it sounds like uh sounds like it was recorded in a submarine while like murdoch was kind of forcing uh 2d to do these vocals while kind of like a robot provides all the musical backing i think when uh when i'm not feeling as generous hearing the fan love for rhinestone eyes kind of makes me feel like that what's that line from zoolander about everybody taking crazy pills like i sometimes feel like i don't see what everybody else sees in the song but i've definitely had moments like that with a fan of myself when i take a step back i do get it like it does have a vibe that's this kind of unlike any other gorilla song and it and it, it it does get there it just doesn't quite do it for me but not surprised to see it on your list i it's 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 so widely loved people just love this song and uh my number six would uh have to be every planet we reach is dead first uh first appearance of demon days not the last though let's uh let's table that one for a minute <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'd, I'd be down for that. Why don't you tell me your number six then? My number meantime. six is New Genius Brother. Cool. Okay. One of one of still one of my favorites from the self-titled for sure. Yeah, I think if this is this is I mean this might be the best non-single hook in the Gorillaz catalog for me. One of my it is my favorite song on the uh, the self-titled. It's a great one. Love that guitar. Everything about this one is cool. Then my number five, I'm proud to say, is Sweet Stakes featuring Most Def. Cool, we're back to Plastic Beach. This is this is a bold choice, I think, because there are some people who have never really warmed up to this one. I think I think it's more of a divisive choice than a bold choice. I think that what I learned in the wake of our Plastic Beach episode is that the cult of sweet steaks is out there. And you are their leader. And I am its leader, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My number five, I'm uh, excited that we're into top five territory now. My number five is also from Plastic Beach. It's a little bit more of a populist pick. Super fast jellyfish. Oh, super fast for sure. Super fast awesome jellyfish. Choice. I mean, this is just this is the band firing on all cylinders for me. I mean, when I think about all the different parts that go into making Gorilla's music, everything just meshes here so well. You've got a big and themic, almost Brit poppy chorus. You've got just such a fun kind of rap contribution from De La Soul, and just the song itself, that bass line, those drums, all the weird synths that come in, really good. And really I, good. I do think, I think more and more about these songs, uh, Moments, Feel Good Inc. and, and Super Fast Jellyfish as being kind of a, tr- a, a triad, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is an important one, because while while Pazdanus holds it down solo on, on uh, Moments, and while Trugoy uh, takes the lead on, on Feel Good Inc., this is the moment where they kind of come together and, and do... De La Soul as De La Soul. That is something that uh, makes me prefer this De La Soul contribution more so than uh, the ones on Feel Good Inc. and Moments for sure. Yeah, this is where it feels like this is the really one time where it feels like Gorilla's featuring De La Soul. Good pick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my number four, Hong Kong. Oh snap, Hong Kong! So close to my top ten. Didn't didn't really just just underneath, just underneath. Okay, this one is just a beauty. Ever since you've told me about your idea about it being like a kind of hidden track at the end of demon days preceded by a little gap of silence and some train noises i have like fallen in love with this one all over again it is a really special song and some of the i think some of the strongest lyrics in the entire gorillas canon also um can we talk about the lyrics because i've been wanting to talk to you about the lyrics so let's let's go behind the scenes a little bit right this is something i brought up in the demon days uh, episode but 
we were feeling a little shaky about it because I, I looked up the lyrics in retrospect and was like, oh, this is not what I thought he's been saying this entire time. So I think we cut that discussion, right? Yeah, we cut it. We cut it. So there's a, there's a, the lyric in contention kind of happens early on in the song. It's, um, you swallow me. I'm a pill on your tongue. Here on the 19th floor, the neon lights, and here's how I hear it. The neon lights make me come. As in C-U-M or C-O-M-E. Yes, as in achieve orgasm. Right. And I just, that is such a striking moment in a Damon Auburn song for me because I can't even talk about that. The way I hear it is just like, I'm really struggling here. I don't even know how to say this. Well, here's how I, here's how I see that lyric, Trevor, is that there's, Hong Kong is in part about divine Western excess and the idea of wires being crossed to the point that you're getting some kind of a sexual high from this weird, cold, urban... Just this release, you know? Not even sexual, just kind of this explosive release. Like these, like Damon being confronted by these lights and this, like, so high up on a 19th floor of a building. Just, I picture him looking out this giant window confronted by the lights of Hong Kong and just being so overwhelmed by it. That's the only kind of feeling he can ascribe to it. And I think that's such a powerful moment and what I think might be the most powerful gorilla song. It's uh, the, the, the alternate fan positive lyric there. Would Which be- is also interesting, yeah. Here on the 19th floor, the neon lights make me calm. It's a complete opposite reading, but it also makes just as much sense when you're talking about society as a kind of life preserver. Sure, and the idea that since you're up on the 19th floor, you're separated from whatever craziness is happening down below, and, and you have some kind of a warm blue glow that's making you calm. I will say that... Uh, that's a that's a tricky dart to throw to have a serious uh, recitation of the word come in a lyric. That's a tightrope walk to to pull off a lyric like that and not make it jarring or kind of take you out of the song. I think it is jarring, but I think it's jarring in an excellent way. It's like almost like a wow moment. I had never known the lyric as come. I'd already I'd always known it as calm. Um, so when you confronted me with it, I was really kind of taken aback by it. But living with that over the last few weeks, I do think it's an interesting choice. I'm still not, I'm still not 100% convinced, but I'm probably 95% convinced that it has come. But like following that episode, I reached out to some Gorillaz fans and I was like, "What do you guys hear this lyric as?" And it seems like pretty divided. My number four, Trevor, is every planet we reach is dead. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it because it's my number, what was it? Number six? Number yeah. six. And my number Love four. Love so this one. We're one pretty of the close best on moments. this one. We're pretty close yeah. on this one. Yeah. Really amazing, this song. We, uh, we, we, you know, we kind of covered this song. I don't have too much more to say about it than I did on the Demon Days uh, episode, but boy, I, it, it is very special and, uh, and earned its spot on both of our lists. Yeah, I mean, just obvious, like, far and away, probably maybe the centerpiece of Demon Days, I think. My number three, the listeners are probably wondering, wait, Humans is your second favorite Gorillaz album and there's no Humans songs on your top ten list? No! Are we about to connect with this right now? Because my number three is also from Humans. No! We we'll probably won't connect on the song, but the album okay. we are. My number three favorite Gorilla song is moments really whoa number three with a bullet yes uh i kind of went through it and i don't think i have more fun with any gorilla song than i do with moments like i i was like thinking is this really my favorite and then the plastic on the ceiling bit started i'm just like this is like my number three gorilla song i fucking love this song it's so much fun so much fun trevor were you very disappointed to learn that um shivers down my backbone wasn't actually damon auburn uh, no, not that disappointed, and more excited to see what Azakel will do on his upcoming Gorilla collaboration, Midnight Float. My number three, another Humans track, Out of Body. Out of Body for Morning Tonight, Dance Floor Packed, and I'm feeling alright. I will never forget the moment, like, the way I felt when Damon jumps back in in this song at the end. Like, that was, like, oh my god. It's such a special and exciting moment. And then my number two... Kind of, I almost consider this to be the first Gorilla song I heard, you know, because Feel Good Inc. really took me in the fold, and I got Demon Days, like, kind of blind. And, um, yeah, Last Living Souls. Last Living Souls is an amazing song. Not surprised to see it on your top ten. I really had no idea what I was in for when I first started listening, but, like, I could not have hoped for anything better, and here we are today. Once again, we've locked, uh, we've, we've linked up on albums, because my number two is another Demon Days song. It is another than... The Sean Ryder, Roses Gabor, Powerhouse, Dare. Yeah, I know you love this one. I was going to be surprised if it didn't make it on your list. Fucking love this song. I mean, it goes without saying. This is just like, to me, this is the, the pop peak of the band. Love it. Love it. And so how are we going to handle number ones? Do you want to say them at the exact same time? 
that would be nonsense. <laughs> I know, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, we'll I'm do gonna, it. Let's you, count to three. Like, All right. Let's count in from three. Three, two, one. And then we'll say it. All, All right. right okay, Ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Clint Eastwood. Busted in blue. Whoa. Whoa. You Busted just blew blue my mind. is my favorite gorilla song. Holy shit. I think Busted in Blue will always be my favorite gorilla song. Because of I, that moment you had on the bench? I think it's because sitting on the steps in that, that little park in Houston where earlier in the night during She's My Caller, a rat came up to look at me. Sitting on that bench, looking at those office buildings, hearing Damon sing, Only I'm a Satellite and I Can't Get Back uh, Without You, thinking about my family being away and all those people in that building's families being away and wondering how I'd feel if the world was ending right now and just the sadness that overcame me and that still overcomes me when I hear this song. There's just nothing else in the Gorillaz catalog that does anything like that to me and Busted in Blue is my favorite Gorilla song and I think will probably always be my favorite Gorilla song. It is a powerful, powerful tune for sure. Clint Eastwood, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's an obvious choice. I don't have a super, like, you know, emotional, no, like, like apocalyptically like emotional response to it like you do with Bust and Blue. But man, this is just, this is still what Gorilla is this for me. I never get tired of seeing them pull this out in an encore. It is so anthemic by this point. It is, it's so, like, it was unlike anything I'd ever heard at, the, at that time. And just, I don't know, man, it is, this is Gorilla's. I, I can't disagree with you. And you know what else I like about this being your number one? I, it validates your whole list. Because now I know for sure. There's no... You're not trying to pull any look how cool Trevor Rickrath is. If your number one's Clint Eastwood, I know you're, you're, you're shooting straight with me. Like, yeah, I just... I love this one, dude. It makes me feel like a kid again. It's a, it's a, it's a special sound that exists in no other pop song, no other gorilla song. Love it. So, yeah, that's... That's us. But what about what about them? <laughs> What about them? Let's hear Let's hear from the people. I got a little bit of business up top. First of all, I want to award three trophies, the Shine On You Crazy Diamond trophies, to the three most interesting slash bizarre selections uh, from listeners. Uh, one award I'd like to give to uh, the listener who ranked the Fia Yunnan special of Busted in Blue as their number nine favorite gorilla song. Sure, okay. I'd like to give another one to a listener who also at number nine ranked the Fi Life Cypher version of Clint Eastwood as their number nine. <laughs> Gotta be trolling. I, it seemed like an honest list to me, Trevor. And uh, right. and the final and the biggest shine on you, Crazy Diamond. Whose number one was film trailer music? Just tell me. No, it was number one. It is a number one. It is a number one. Their number one favorite Gorilla song is Sleeping Powder. Fuck off. And fortune favors the bold, Trevor. And that is that embodies the spirit of the Shine On You Crazy Diamond Award. Okay. I, I can only hope that, you know, the rest of the listener base was able to come to a consensus that is a little more uh, sane. Well, now, see, that's the beauty of emergent intelligence. Because the outliers, they, they don't move the boat. They don't move the needle. It's the consensus, no. right? Let's see where that needle did move to, though. Uh, first, I want to explain that the rankings, the weighting of the votes was done a little bit differently this time because it wouldn't really be fair to do like number one be worth 10 points because it would be so hard for other songs to come back from that. If we were all ranking the same 10 Gorilla songs, then it'd be fair. Uh, but this is stretching across the entire catalog. So instead, what we did is number one is worth four points, number two, three, and four are worth three, five, six, and seven worth two, eight, nine, and ten are worth one point. And uh, that's how we waited it. Let's get into it. Yeah, don't keep me in suspense any longer. I think you're going to be pretty excited about some of these picks, Trevor. Great. Coming in at number 10 with 15 points, do your thing. Nice. Cool. Right on. That's fucking badass, right? I, I nailed that one. Was not expecting that. Was really excited when that, when that started to come together. Okay. Number nine, I got to say right now, there are some ties on this list. And I sure. let them I let them share the ranking because I didn't know how to do it elsewise, you know? Okay. So number nine, each with 16 points. Some cool ones here. We've got To Binge. Nice. That was very close to being on my list. We've got Hong Kong. There. Okay. And here's the shocker, Trevor, with 16 points. Sweepstakes made the list. There you go. You're vindicated. I'm so vindicated by that. Way to go, Team Sweepstakes. We love you. So how about uh, how about what what are we on eight now? Yeah, Let's number eight is another another tie uh, between Saturn's Bars and Broken. 
Saturn's Bars also is very close to being my list because, I mean, that really does feel like one of the big triumphant comeback moments of the band. Yeah, for sure. It's very special. Really good. Both of those mm-hmm. songs, by the way, got 17 points, but with 18 points and at number seven, a little bit more aircraft vindication, super fast jellyfish. Sick. Cool. Way to go, guys. Good to see him, right? Not doesn't surprise me at all that that's a fan favorite. Uh oh, we got another tie at number six. Uh, a Demon Days back to back with 19 points each. Last Living Souls and November Has Come. Both great choices. I really, it hurt me not to put November Has Come on my list. Number five, Trevor, might be either my favorite or second favorite surprise on this list. Top five, ready to be surprised. With 25 points, a, a, clear, a clear number five. Yeah, that's a, that's a step up, yeah. Every planet we reach is dead. Okay, cool. I'm glad. I'm glad to see it here. You you ranked at number six. I ranked at number four. Our listeners ranked at number five. We can just meet in the middle. God bless. And then at number four, Trevor, this is a this is not too surprising. With 27 points, Rhinestone Eyes. Actually, I am a little surprised to see this one make it so far up there. I don't know. I always see. I I've always seen. Maybe I'm more intensely aware of it since I'm not on board with it. But but I've always seen a lot of fan support uh, for this right, song. Yeah. How about number three? Okay, I'm going to say right now, Trevor, one, two, and three, why don't you take a wild f- fucking guess? One, two, it's, and three. It's, it's not their three most played songs on Spotify. Why don't you take a wild fucking guess, Trevor? Is three on Melancholy Hill? <laughs> Number three on Melancholy Hill. Is two Feel Good Inc.? No! Two's Clint Eastwood, then. Clint Eastwood, and number one. And then number one is Feel Good Inc. But guess what? What? Bombshell, because number three is a tie! With what? Oh boy! Can you even fathom? Can you? Can you? I'd Wait, love give me to second. hear. Give me a second to guess. Give me a second I'd to guess. I'd love to hear your guess for what tied number three. I'd fucking love to hear. Give me a hint. Female vocalist. It's not Dare. It can't be Dare. Female vocalist. Empire Ants. Empire Ants tied for number three. Nailed with it. Thirty-nine points. Fucking Empire Ants killed it this week, man. Doesn't surprise me. I know plenty of people who say this is their number one gorilla song. This is so crazy. I was so excited to see it climbing the ranks throughout the last couple of weeks of voting. Giving the big three a run for their money. I can't believe the top three are the most streamed songs. Well, I guess that that's the nature of... Because here's the thing. It's not like everybody was ranking Feel Good Inc. and Clint Eastwood as their number one and number two. Right, of course. It just made the most appearances, I So guess. many people ranked it as their number five or their number four yeah. or whatever, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there is something to Emergent Intelligence. I think that this this list is a really good balance. Yeah, if anything, if anything, we've proved that. Of populism and just solid fucking hits, you know? Yep. I want to point out a couple of things. We didn't hear anything from the fall on this list, but I should point out that Amarillo had the the most votes with uh, nine points on Amarillo. That doesn't surprise me. What about G-Sides? We that didn't have any... anything from G-Sides, but there was a pretty strong showing for the English version of Latin Simone with nine points, which I thought was that pretty was, cool. I honestly kind of forgot about that one, and you messaged me about uh, this whole ranking uh, last night, I believe, where you were saying, should I combine the votes for Latin Simone and K Basa Contigo? And I was like, shit, that was supposed to go on my list. Yeah, so I didn't combine them. English and, and regular yeah. Latin Simone remain separate. But even if they had, they wouldn't have cracked the top ten. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out, Trevor, is Clint Eastwood was the only song from the self-titled to make an appearance on this top ten. I noticed that, yeah. What would you guess were number two and number three from the self-titled? I feel like 19, 2000 would probably be in there. That would have been my guess, too, but it wasn't. The number two and number three were New Genius Brother. Wow. Cool pick. And yeah. let's, I'm excited for what noises are about to come out of you. And sound check gravity. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm almost willing here to give out my personal email, just so anyone who voted for that has, like, just so somebody <laughs> could reach out to me and explain how that happened, because I am baffled a lot of people voted for it a lot of people voted for it it's true that brings us to the end of our of our award ceremony and i guess also to the end of the season trevor yeah the end of season two hallelujah monkeys now let's let's check in at the beginning of this show you said we might be we might be done are we going to reconvene next week i gotta say there's just as as burnt as i am by the lack of an out-of-body video just i feel like there's so much more stuff we got to cover because really We've only touched on the musical side of this oh band Oh my god, so far. here's my impression of our podcast since we started. Damon Albert! 
Damon Albright. So I love smart Damon and Albert. good. We love him. Meanwhile, in the corner, Jamie Hewlett just kind of like tapping his foot. I'm the other guy watch, in this band. Going like, guys, guys, I'm here too. <laughs> So that means that next week we're going to start into season three of the podcast where hopefully we'll, we'll bring in the art and the lore uh, of, of Gorillaz. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It should be a really fun season. Uh, make sure to, to find us on Discord and Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and Tumblr. We're out there. Use Google. Find us. Yeah, we love when you guys reach out to us and we were just, we loved going through all your top 10 songs and album rankings. It's, it's such an, it's so nice to know that we have kind of built our own little community around this podcast. It's very exciting and very rewarding. I also wanted to say so many of you who have reached out to us have mentioned finding us by searching the word gorillas on iTunes. Um, which uh, which is very cool, and I'd love so How many. How cool is that? I'd love so many more of you to find us that way. So if you're a listener of the show and you you like this show, I'd love I'd love to invite you to write us an iTunes review uh, because that apparently bumps us up higher on that search algorithm. We also just love reading them. Yeah. Also, it just makes us happy when you guys say cool things about us. It makes us happy when you guys draw pictures of us and and write emails to us thanking us for the show. It, it's a uh, it's made such a difference in both of our lives, I think. Yeah, please send in more fan art because that kind of shit just like tickles me. Trevor, should I should I force a piece of drama and like have a big sudden reveal in our in our finale episode? In like the last like two minutes of the podcast? Yeah, why not? Go ahead. All right, here it comes. This December, I'm having a baby. Right. You are going to be a father. What's it like being um an old person? Um well, apparently, here's what it's like. You like Demon Days a lot more than most of our listeners. <laughs> no, it's going to be amazing. Uh, if if it's a boy, we're naming him Kellen. And if it's a girl, we're naming her uh, Noodle, Paula Cracker, Cyborg Noodle, Flynn. I'm just saying, Jamie is a perfectly general neutral name. And Damon is a is a is a boy's name, so I could if it's maybe if it's fraternal male and female twins, we'll just name them Damon and Jamie. That'd be perfect. I mean, you would be the Ultimate Gorillas fan, I believe. All right. Until next time, I'm Dylan Flynn. I'm Trevor Ickrath. This is going to be hard because we're moving into a, a sector of this show where we no longer are talking about song lyrics. Right. So I feel like we, we've really got to come up with a singular sign off. Well, in lieu of that, let me just end on an earnest note, Trevor, and say I really love you, dude. I'm so glad you do this show with me. That's so nice. I love you too, Dylan. All right. See you next week. Later. <laughs>